Welcome everyone. Jeff Jensen, Director of Community Programs here with Trees Forever, and we have got another great Stewards of the Beautiful Land webinar in store for you today. Uh, I should check my, yep, I have 12 noon. Uh, so we're gonna get into it. I'd like to welcome uh, Billy Beck, ISU Extension Forester. Um, he's going to be our presenter here today. But before we get into it, just a few things, uh, Stewards of the Beautiful Land, um, specific so our agenda today is pretty straightforward we're going to listen to billy and uh, get the big picture on iowa forestry uh, i want to remind you that you should be able to see and hear us but we can't see or hear you and so that means the way that you can interact with us is through the questions tab so please feel free to utilize that questions tab with any questions that you might have we're, you can type them in anytime during the presentation. I'll be monitoring it and I'll answer as I can. Otherwise, we'll wait till the end and, and have uh, we'll go through a, a little question and answer session with, with Billy here. So this will be recorded. We'll go ahead and post this to our YouTube page and then I'll send out a link um, to everybody. Or I'll send an email out with that link and then any additional links that might come up as far as PDFs or anything that uh, Billy might want to share with us here. So. With that, I wanna remind you to connect with us on Facebook. We have a Stewards of the Beautiful Land Facebook group. We've been posting some pictures and some videos there. Uh, so stay up to date with Stewards of the Beautiful Land and all the great, or pardon me, uh, prairie plants starting to bloom here now. Uh, boy, it's really starting to be colorful out there on the landscape. <clears throat> Please save the date. Uh, today is our webinar. We have another one in two weeks and that's going to be Gina Bulo, Trees Forever Field Coordinator. Uh, this one's gonna be really fun. Bugs for beginners. So Gina's gonna talk about a, a bunch of different bugs and the relationships with different plants. And um, another name might be Entomology 101, but this is gonna be all for folks interested in some of the different bugs, uh, pollinators, and what? Are all bugs pollinators? Probably in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> And I want to remind you, if you want to keep tabs with Stewards of the Beautiful Land, this is how you can do it. Go to our website under the Learn tab, then Stewards of the Beautiful Land, and that's where you can find information about all the different webinars coming up. Oh, I got to get this slide updated here. Uh, and then the field days that are coming up. And those field days, we have a Tuesday, pardon me, August field days, because I believe today is the last field day that we have for July. That's down in Mahaska County. Otherwise, we had field days already in Okaboji here last night and then in Franklin County and Carroll County. So look into August. And in August, it's going to be Prairie Bingo and Roadsides in Okaboji at the Mazier Monarch Lodge. Monarch Lodge, pardon me. And then on the 9th, uh, again, they're going to be playing Prairie Bingo down in Carroll County. And then on the 9th, uh, it's going to be over at the Mains Grove Lodge in Franklin County. And then Saturday, the 12th, boy, this is going to be a fun one. Tree ID Walk, and then the Environmental Learning Center uh, down there in Mahaska County. A chance to see that and experience all the cool things that they have. A couple of other upcoming webinars. We have our Food Forest Forum coming up on the 28th, uh, a Woodland Invasive Species uh, webinar. That's going to be fascinating with T-Bone Feely. So lots of good stuff uh, to get on the calendar and lots of great webinars for you to learn more. With that, hey, let's get to it. Billy? Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You can share your screen and we should be off. Okay. Can you see my screen, Jeff? And can you hear me good? I can indeed. We're off and running. Thank you. Super. Well, first up, uh, I want to just big thanks to Trees Forever and Jeff for having me here. Um, I love these opportunities to highlight uh, the forestry a resource that we have here in Iowa and, and just a big thanks to Trees Forever in general for all the great things that you all do for our rural and our urban uh, forest canopies in the state and region so so thanks a million for that so real quick I always like when speakers give kind of a background telling you where they're coming from so my name is Billy I'm the extension forestry specialist with uh, Iowa State University Extension Outreach and also uh, with the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management here at ISU um, I've got a three-way split here in the department. I do mostly extension work, which is bringing the university to the people. Um, but then I do some research to inform that extension and I do some teaching here uh, in the department. Uh, I cover all 99 counties uh, for forestry education and extension, which is really cool because I get to meet great people like Jeff and I get to talk to you all and learn a ton. 
Uh, my background's in forestry, but I also uh, have a background in water quality and hydrology. So my programs and my research, I like to combine those two. So how can trees help us clean up our waters and streams and address flooding issues? I'm from the Midwest. Um, I'm a forester from the Midwest. So I love, again, I love these opportunities because a lot of people think of the Midwest and they think there's no trees there. There's no role for trees there. Trees have no value there. So, um, but that's not true. So I'm really excited to um, highlight the great resource we have here in the state of Iowa. So this is kind of the theme for the day, a theme for every day, I guess, for me. I really try to, um, communicate this and spread the word on this wherever I go is that really trees forests and forestry are a big part of Iowa they're kind of they're part of our cultural heritage uh, they're part of our current livelihood and economy and they're definitely going to be a big part of our future um, these are just some quick facts I like to throw out and this fit picture behind uh, behind me on the screen here is actually down in Stevens State Forest in Lucas County and this is something you wouldn't really think of when you think of Iowa this is a feller buncher so this is a big machine that with this big head on it, grabs a tree, cuts it off. Those teeth on the inside of it rake the tree, delimbing it, and then it puts it back into that forward there for, for moving it off the site. But you would think of this maybe in Oregon or, or Georgia or somewhere, but no, this is right here in Iowa. And that's Jess Flatt, former manager of the, of the State Forest and, and ISU alum in the blue hoodie there. But these are just some quick facts I like to throw out and we'll, we'll touch on these as we move forward here. Uh, we've got 3 million acres of forest in the state of Iowa. This is down from 7 million approximately back in the mid 1800s. We've got 150,000 forest landowners with a 20 acre average ownership. And this presents some challenges, as you can imagine, uh, with different scales of, of management. We grow arguably, I wouldn't even say arguably, I'll just say it. We grow the highest quality white oak and black walnut on planet Earth. ISU is one of the oldest forestry programs in the US. So not just the Midwest, but the US. ISU is the, one of the oldest forestry programs. And our forests have a huge impact, which we'll touch on to soil, water, air, recreation, wildlife, economy. And then the past few years highlighted really uh, an impact on our, on our mental health. So a positive impact on our mental health. So these are just some quick facts that really I wanna hit home that uh, they do have a role in our state. They're a part of our state. Uh, they have great value to our state. Um, and I want to highlight that the profile of them uh, in Iowa and the Midwest. So today's plan, some real quick definitions to get some things clear. And then we're going to talk about the history of forests in Iowa and the current land cover. We'll get into some quick ecology and dynamics of our woodlands. Uh, we'll go into some management, which is critical for the resiliency of our woodlands. And then we'll end with some value. And um, I didn't put this on here, but we'll touch on ways to become more more engaged which is what you're doing right now by participating in this webinar so so real quick we get this a lot especially in iowa that's a kind of a transitional zone between the you know western tall grass prairie and the eastern deciduous forest there's a lot of terms that we use to describe you know where we're standing on the landscape uh and honestly that really depends on what your goal is like what are you trying to accomplish with that term but in general, this I like to use the, the definition presented by this slide, um, and it go, comes down to trees per acre. Is it a forest? Is it a woodland? Is it a savanna? Is it a grassland? And I think y'all have touched on prairies up to this point. Um, so this is kind of um, transitioning from that prairie all the way up to more dense, densely covered uh, area called the forest. So trees per acre, savanna, you're looking at 0.5 to 47 trees per acre. Woodland is a little bit more, has a little bit more stems per acre, more canopy closure. So 48 to 99 trees per hectare. Um, and then forest, you're looking above 99 trees per hectare. So it's to me, I use this a lot, but for this, for this, uh, all technical details aside, for today's presentation, I'll probably use woodland and forest interchangeably. Forestry. Now this is a definition I think that um, a lot of people have a different idea of what it means. It dawned on me one day when I was on the phone waiting for some insurance thing and they asked me what I did. And I said, I was a forester and they said, oh, what is that? And I kind of struggled for a second. I was like, I don't know how to quickly define that. So I looked up the definition of forestry and um, this is how it's defined by the Society of American Foresters, which is our home professional society. Um, and is the science, art and business 
of managing and conserving forests and associated resources in a sustainable manner to meet desired goals, needs, and values. So really, we manage our forest resource for economics, societal benefit, and then ecological or ecosystem goods and services that benefit you know, the entire state of Iowa and the world, honestly. And like if you look at Trees Forever's great work, um, this spans rural facet and an urban facet too. Me, um, I tend to focus almost exclusively on the rural setting, rural forest management, not because urban's not critical, it's just I need to really focus on one thing. Uh, it's a job for two people to do rural, rural and urban. Uh, but for me, I tend to focus uh, a lot on rural, but a lot of the concepts are, are, are applicable to both, both settings. So you can impress your friends now with the definition of forestry. All right. So I think y'all have talked about prairie in the past. And one of the cool things about prairie is so much biomass underneath the surface of the earth. That's what made our incredibly fertile uh, black soils that we have in this state. Forests offer a striking contrast to this. So compared to prairies, the main biomass pool in forests is above ground and quite visible, <laughs> primarily in the form of trunks and crowns. And kind of uh, contrasting to prairies, underground, the tree roots tend to go much more wide than deep, often extending a, hor a horizontal distance up to three times the tree's height. So again, this is kind of striking a difference than the deep rooted nature of prairie vegetation. And it kind of makes us, uh, reminds us that, you know, what we do in the vicinity of a tree beyond the drip line can impact that tree. And uh, on the right here, this is kind of a neat, this is not Iowa, this is actually Southern Michigan in a lowland area with a high water table. So not a lot of deep roots. What happened here, but I love this because it shows that most of the roots are in the upper portion of the soil profile. And that's really, really important for protecting against soil compaction and other things um, as we manage our woodlands. So what happened here was there was clearing for development to the west of this, uh, where the wind was actually coming from. And when that development cleared a large section of this woodland out, this tree that had been now protect, had, had been protected from those heavy winds was now exposed to them. And because of the shallow root system in the high water table, it toppled over. So I just thought this was a really neat example of showing um, Huge biomass above the ground, not that much biomass relatively below the ground as compared to prairies. So, so uh, Iowa's land cover, this has never been static. I know a lot of folks think that um, time stands still and a forest should look like a forest no matter what uh, millennium you're in, but Iowa's land cover has never been static. So since the most recent glaciation, the area that is now Iowa has seen waves of land cover change, driven by climate and other factors. Uh, as the glaciers receded north and temperatures increased, tundra, if you can imagine tundra uh, in downtown Des Moines, uh, gave way to spruce fir forests, which would kind of look like northern day or present day northern Canada, and then eventually to oaks, maples, and other deciduous trees around 8,000 years before present. As the climate became increasingly warmer and drier over the following millennia, deciduous forests gave way to drought resistant prairie vegetation around 4,000 years before present. Or actually, I'm sorry, drought resistant prairie vegetation at, at that time. Then at 4,000 years before present, the climate shifted again back towards favoring deciduous trees, but the prairie persisted uh, in a climate that was actually favorable to forests due to natural and indigenous fire. So these forests are not static. They change over time based on many, 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 many factors. So back in the 1800s, you've probably seen this map before, uh, but this was a land cover map from the 1800s. At this point in time, Iowa has approximately 7 million acres of forest land cover in the dark green there. And it represents a unique transition zone between the tall grass prairie and the eastern deciduous forests. You'll notice as you move further west on the map uh, with the gradient of decreasing annual precipitation, forests become more and more restricted to the river valleys and stream side areas. At this point in time, the 1800s, land conversion and non-sustainable timber harvest started a trend of decreasing forest land cover in Iowa. Which brings us to today, modern land cover. At present, Iowa has about 3 million acres of forest land cover. 
So that's a loss of 4 million acres since the 1800s, primarily due to land conversion and non-sustainable harvest practices. So with the 1800s map, current forest land cover and tree species diversity decreases along a west to northwest direction following the precipitation gradient. A cool example of this, that red dashed line there is um, the fact that most of our 12 native oak species inhabit southeast Iowa, while only one, the bur oak, is found in our northwesternmost counties. Another interesting note is that many species in Iowa's southeast and northeast counties are what I'll call like species on the edge. So in other words, species found in these corners of the state are often on the southern or northern extreme edge of their range. For example, like balsam fir, a northern conifer, may be found in northeast Iowa, and common persimmon, a species associated with southern states, may be found in our southeastern counties. So, as you can imagine, tree species with similar environmental requirements are often found growing together on the landscape. And we like to call these groupings forest communities. They're often called types or associations, but we'll go with forest communities uh, for today. So anywhere you're at in Iowa, most natural stands can be placed into one of the five communities you see here. And we'll, we'll, we'll go through these uh, quickly in a second. So wherever you're at, start thinking, okay, what community do I think I might be standing in right now? And before we hit these, real quick, um, I want to get some key definitions out of the way. Uh, first, species composition, that's pretty straightforward. Each community has a main species mix comprising the canopy. However, there are a range of other species present, and this mix is going to vary slightly with geography. So each species mix creates a unique forest structure. So by forest structure, I mean the physical layout of the forest. So structure can be described vertically, primarily as the number of strata or layers that are present. So in this photo, for example, you got to kind of squint your eyes, but you can see three strata. You've got your overstory, the main canopy, your midstory, kind of that advanced regeneration, and then the understory, some seedlings and, and the shrub layer there. So next time you're out in the woods, try to observe what kind of forest structure you're seeing there. You can also describe horizontal forest structure, which is a little less clear, but I define it as looking side to side. How is the forest layout change as you look side to side? For me, a big one is forest gaps, so gaps in the canopy as you look side to side. Another big one I like to look at is down woody material, so down trees, down logs, tops that are laying on the ground. That's another thing I look at as like kind of a mix between vertical and horizontal structure. So as we hit these next few slides, Pay attention to the species composition and structure within each forest community. Okay, the oak hickory community is probably our most well-known community. It's probably what you think of when you think of a typical Iowa forest. So these often occur on dry uplands and south and west facing slopes. So areas of landscape with greater sun exposure, higher temps and lower available moisture. The main canopy may be dominated by a mix of white, burr, and black oak, as well as shagbark hickory. Other less prevalent canopy species may include things like shingle oak, mockernut hickory, black cherry, and quaking aspen. So with all these communities, remember that that species mix and species representation are gonna vary with geography. The maple basswood community commonly occurs on moist, well-drained uplands, especially on north and east facing slopes. So areas typified by lesser sun exposure, lower temperatures, and greater available moisture. So one key thing here is that these canopy species exhibit a great deal of shade tolerance, which means they can photosynthesize at a relatively high rate in shaded conditions. One key structural observation here in this photo is the amount of shade cast by the dense maple basswood canopy. So take a look at that canopy, take a look at what we call the live crown ratio of the portion of the tree that's represented by the crown, 
those leaves go down a great distance on the canopy and they cast a lot of shade. But that uh, is something they can photosynthesize at a high capacity in, in that shade. So that's one key thing to remember about this particular uh, forest community is that high shade tolerance. Oh boy, as a water quality person, I, I really get excited about this one. Not that more excited about the other ones, but anyway. Our bottomland forest, our bottomland hardwood community occurs on larger floodplains and low-lying terraces. A wide range of species may comprise the forest canopy, most of which have a relatively high tolerance for flooding and poorly drained soil or periodic inundation. And I'll say this, healthy bottomland forests are absolutely critical for water quality and flood mitigation. Next is the riparian community, somewhat similar, but a little bit different. So riparian refers to streamside, and this community re represents narrow belts of forest along our smaller waterways. So like bottomland forests, the species mix here could be quite diverse. Riparian forests are directly connected to streams and thus essential for water quality. So that direct connection is really, really important there. Proper functioning in this community provides Things like stream bank stabilization, stream shading and cooling, critical habitat for aquatic biota, and many more positive impacts on the waterways they border. So just in general, uh, canopy composition, looking at things like silver maple, box elder, cottonwood, black willow, peach leaf willow. I'll make a note, some of these are not the best yard trees, and I hear about that a lot, but they are incredible riparian species with a ton of value. And then other species present, huge mix, and a lot of it is uh, due to what's available in any kind of adjacent bottomland hardwood uh, forest there. So very, very uh, important community just for the fact that they're directly connected to our waterways. And lastly, we have our Northern Conifer hardwood community, which is not nearly as prevalent as our forest four communities, but, um, still important, still very cool. One of the unique things about Iowa forestry. Uh, these are restricted to Northeast Iowa. Uh, this community is a great example of that species on the edge concept I mentioned earlier. Um, this species is dominated, the species mix is dominated by trees and shrubs on the southernmost extreme of their ranges. So I love this community for that fact and that it adds something very unique and special to Iowa's already fascinating mix of forest communities. If you want to see this up close, take a trip to Yellow River State Forest um, any time of the year, but I'll plug this. We have a, a standing field day, forestry field day every year up there, uh, usually the first week of October. Um, but if you want to see this up close, check out Yellow River State Forest. It's a great, 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 great place. So you're going to see things that honestly you wouldn't really expect to see in Iowa, but they're native here. So you have Eastern white pine, balsam fir, yellow birch, big tooth and quaking aspen, uh, Canada yew, believe it or not, high bush cranberry, speckled alder, uh, at one point, or diminishing now, black ash. So rare but unique community. And I wanted to hit this real quick. I, folks often forget one invaluable structural component of woodlands, and that is the understory. Folks often look up and only up. Uh, but this layer has huge implications implications for nutrient tension, pollinators, aesthetics, and, and so much more. So what, next time you're out in the woods, remember to look down and uh, experience the forest understory and its incredible value. Okay, getting into some ecology and dynamics here. Um, like I said earlier, forests are not static. They change in species composition and structure through time. So this predictable and orderly pattern of change is referred to as forest succession. So succession occurs or forest succession occurs when one vegetative community succeeds into another community in the absence of major disturbance. Disturbance being a key word we'll touch on here in a sec. In general, the preceding community kind of sets the stage for the succeeding community to establish and dominate. So this is an ultra simplistic representation here, but check out how structure changes through time and how that may influence critical growth factors, such as 
the amount of sunlight reaching both individual canopies and the forest floor. So as an example, let's take a look at an oak hickory community right here in Iowa. This is actually from the Southeast. Uh, image A represents an early successional stage. It's typified by what I would say a brushy look with a massive amount of sunlight hitting the forest floor and a sun loving species assemblage, which includes many early colonizing species and young trees of small size. So despite its appearance, this is a forest and has critical value to wildlife, pollinators and society. Image B represents a mid successional stage. So from A over time, the individual trees in image A grow and vie for dominance shading out their neighbors. A good deal of sun hits the floor, but not nearly as much as we see in image A. And this results in a lower density understory. Young seedlings of shade tolerant species, such as maple and basswood, are now beginning to establish in the shaded understory and outpace any present oak or hickory regeneration. The tall kind of open oak hickory canopy established uh, mid-story and fair, I'm sorry, the tall and open oak hickory canopy established mid-story and a fairly dense understory provide a structural kind of sweet spot for maximum wildlife diversity. So you got that kind of thick canopy, established mid-story, fairly dense understory. That's a lot of niches that a lot of different wildlife species can occupy. So that's just kind of what we call the, the sweet spot for maximum wildlife diversity. Not that the bookends aren't important, but if we're looking at this one particularly, that's a really cool highlight. So over time, the overstory oaks and hickories, they're going to die. I mean, hundreds of years, but they're going to die. And these create large canopy gaps, which means added sunlight to the forest floor in the midstory. So guess who's first in line to take advantage of that new sunlight and enter the main canopy? It's the shade tolerant later successional species such as maple and basswood, which brings us to image C. So like we showed before, observe the intense shade cast by this maple basswood canopy. Without major disturbance, like fire, tornadoes, ice storms, grazing by you know bison and whatnot, forests will remain in later successional stages in perpetuity. So one key here is that there is no true start and end to forest succession. It's just snapshots in time waiting to be influenced by the next disturbance. And I wanna hit this before we go any further, that species diversity in the early successional stage is incredible. We were walking out here, uh, this is again, this is in Southeast Iowa and we saw hazelnut, wild strawberry, cherry, oak, so many, much more. Uh, really, really cool. A lot of folks don't like that brushy kind of early forest, but it has, and we could just hear the pollinators buzzing around. It was super, super, super cool. So high, high, high value. And it's uh, a successional stage we're really losing across the state with lack of disturbance. So if Iowa, I mean, if disturbance is a, I'm sorry, if the succession marches on and on, um, why is Iowa not completely covered in late successional forests? Well, that is because of one word, and that's disturbance. So fire, wind, ice, and other events regulate succession. They do this by speeding it up, slowing it down, or completely resetting the process. So again, it's all about structure and available sunlight. Think about how each of these disturbances may impact forest structure and thus succession. And this was a big disturbance we saw about uh, going on three years ago. And I don't know if y'all can guess this or not, but this was the 2020 derecho. This was a photo from Lynn County, Iowa. But think about how that disturbance uh, changed forest structure and either sped up or slowed down forest succession. So because you know natural disturbances are quite unpredictable and impossible to control, foresters often mimic natural disturbance to achieve management goals, such as promoting the oak hickory community. Um, if we don't stop succession and, and, and hit it back, we're gonna progress to maple basswood. 
Not that that's not bad, um, but maybe our management goal is okay, great. This manipulation of forest species composition and structure by foresters is known as silviculture. So that mimic of natural disturbance, all these activities, that practice is known as silviculture. We manipulate the species composition and the structure to achieve our management objectives. So in the following slides, um, I'll review some common management practices that we foresters use on the landscape. And just think about how each practice may impact forest structure and thus succession. Um, I'm sure in your discussions on prairie ecosystems, we'll start with this one here, prescribed fire. Uh, the key role of prescribed fire and how that plays in prairie management probably became pretty evident. Uh, well, actually, it's becoming an increasingly utilized tool in forest management as well, especially when it comes to oaks. Um, so this knocks back shade tolerant species, it promotes oak and other fire tolerant species, and it keeps that uh, sweet spot of middle succession that we're looking for if we want to manage for oak uh, on the landscapes. Prescribed fire is a tool that's becoming more and more common in forest management. Thinning. This is the one that uh, a lot of landowners, you know, sometimes it's hard to swallow because you're going to have to kill some trees. And that's okay if you do it in a sustainable manner, in a plan that's um, created by an, an oversaw, oversaw ugh, <laughs> administered by a, a professional forester. So thinning is a common practice that allows foresters to allocate more sunlight to the canopies of desired species, those species that meet a specific management goal. So a desired species in your property may be a different uh, than a desired species on somebody else's property. So we can do this in a wide range of ways. In this photo here, this elm, we've uh, applied a double chainsaw girdle. So this practice uses a chainsaw to sever cambial and vascular tissue, which seizes sap transport and ultimately kills the tree. It's really quick. You don't have to fell the tree and remove it from the woodlands. You can, I mean, not fly, but you can go very fast over a number of acres and do this thinning practice without having to haul the trees out. And that standing wood has a great deal of value for wildlife uh, and insects. It adds a unique uh, structural element uh, to your woodland there. So there's a wide range of, of ways wide range of techniques on how to thin, and I can include that in the um, the resource sheet, the electronic resource sheet I share with you all after. Timber harvest. So if thinning gets folks kind of freaked out, timber harvest definitely does at first, until folks start talking to their forester and realize it is a very, very important tool. Um, again, very important tool in forest management. Uh, and one thing to remember here is that harvest is not the end of a forest, but it only nudges the forest ecosystem in a specific successional direction. Really, the only way to eliminate or remove a forest is to convert it to row crop, a parking lot, housing, something like that. They're very resilient. And when done right, timber harvest is an important tool. So photo A is a kind of a cool photo I like. It kind of sh uh, shows you what a little bit of what goes on in a timber harvest. This is a, a nice black walnut. Um, side note, one of or our most valuable tree dollar-wise uh, per unit volume in the state of Iowa. Uh, and they're so valuable, they, they generally make up the bulk of folks' timber sales. So because of that, they're numbered individually by the forester. So the buyer and the logger can come out and look at them prior to cutting. So they'll mark the top with a blue line so the logger can see them. They'll also mark the bottom with that dot. So once they're cut, you know that every tree cut was marked by the forester. So every tree cut was marked to be cut. If you see a cut that was uh, not marked at the base, that, tr uh, that tree was not marked by the forester and maybe some um, need to have a, a discussion after that. But anyway, some cool little things that happened during a harvest there. In photo B, we see the result of a clear cut harvest, which has a lot of kind of bad stigma. But clear cut harvest is an important step in oak management systems. So our goal here is to set back succession and create an early successional forest while at the same time harvesting valuable and renewable oak timber. So what you can't see in the background are thousands of oak seedlings ready to take advantage of this newly provided sunlight. 
So without this harvest, without that large, massive, multi-acre canopy gap that we created, this forest stand would have succeeded to maple basswood. So we wanted oak on the landscape. This was the appropriate tool to use in that case. And it's gonna be a diverse, very vibrant young forest in about, oh heck, the next growing season. So a lot of people kind of are, are, are hesitant to do timber harvest, but once they know the, the physiology and the science behind it and the management concepts behind it, um, they generally warm up to it. But um, another thing about harvest too, is look at all that downed wood in the background. A lot of people don't like that. They think it's unsightly. Um, it's got a messy look to it. Like, oh my gosh, what did you do to my woodland? But this is very normal. You know, when done right, it's gonna have a, a messy look like this. And that downed wood, is incredibly valuable for wildlife pollinators, soil organic matter in the future. Unless it's really blocking your access lanes or inhibiting some uh, management goal of yours, that downed wood has a lot of value. So as I mentioned before, Iowa has lost about 4 million acres of forest over the past few centuries. Thus, reforestation potential is immense and an important forest management practice, honestly. Uh, planting trees and or seed allows foresters to achieve management goals through controlling the species composition and structure of the future forest. Establishing native species and a diverse assemblage of species on the landscape is key to the resiliency of Iowa's forest resource. So that's so important, I'll hit it again, is that natives and a diverse assemblage of species on the landscape are key to our future resiliency. And just a little bit about management post planting. I'm not gonna get into this, but I'll share some resources with y'all in that sheet. Uh, just like ag crops, you can't simply plant trees and walk away. Uh, they require three to five years of diligent maintenance. By maintenance, I mean uh, weed control, uh, pest control, irrigation, not maybe irrigation, but making sure they get appropriate water, any kind of thinning that may be needed. So they really need a protection from cattle, protection from deer, protection from rabbit browsing. Um, they need some help the first three to five years to really take off and become properly established. So don't just plant and walk away. So, so those are some of the techniques we use. So we use those techniques to get to these management objectives that we're seeking and a big one is ecosystem goods and services. So I'll just hit these real quick. This is gonna be an entire class uh, at IUCU about the ecosystem service value of our forest, but at only 8% of Iowa's land cover, remember that it's only 8%, forests provide Iowans with a disproportionately large value in terms of ecosystem goods and services. You know, again, as compared to their small, landscape footprint. So often in the literature, these are busted up into four categories. You've got provisioning services. So what do they provide? They give us clean water. They give us timber, fuel wood, things like that. Regulating services such as climate, flood mitigation, pollination. Supporting services like soil formation and nutrient cycling. Think of the soil erosion saving, free soil erosion savings by this, this forest here. Uh, nutrient cycling. Cultural services like education, aesthetics, cultural heritage values, and like I said before, like the last three years, mental health benefits, you know, just to name a few. So massive value for the small footprint uh, on the landscape. And side note again, uh, this is Yellow River State Forest in Alamakee County, Iowa in the fall, if you ever wanna get up there and um, witness this very cool part of our state. Talked about pollination, and I wrote a blog on this back in the spring, and a lot of people don't, I just wanted to hit this real quick, a lot of folks don't, you know, they don't think of trees when they think of pollinators. Um, and a lot of times it's because they're kind of drab. They're not that showy, not showing off, you know. But uh, one cool point I'll make is that trees are often the first things to bloom in the spring which offers pollinator critical early fuel. So these are just some of the examples of things that bloom early and they're not very showy. They're kind of yellow and drab. This is on the left, silver maple, and then uh, willow species in the middle, middle, and then box elder on the, on the right there. So trees are, are very critical, not only for nectar and pollen, but also for habitat for pollinators. 
All right. So I, I hate saying uh, the value of a tree is solely dollars, uh, which is why I started with ecosystem goods and services. But Iowa's forests have a powerful and frequently overlooked economic impact. Again, we grow arguably the best black walnut and white oak on planet Earth. Um, just some quick numbers here. We sell $40 million of standing timber sold, or we, or we sell $40 million of standing timber annually, which honestly could be much greater if landowners engaged in more active forest management. Our forest products industry supports about 50,000 jobs altogether, indirect, ind directly and indirectly, uh, which equates to supporting 5 billion in economic output. So if you do some quick math there, back of the envelope calculations, um, it's about 1,700 bucks an acre output per year uh, from each acre of forest. So not too bad for only 8% of our land cover. We're really trying to raise the profile of this. Uh, and last year, the governor uh, signed a declaration that the third week in October is now Iowa Forest Products Week. So we're really gonna try working with the DNR to uh, highlight that uh, more and more as the years go by. And if you ever get the chance to see a logging operation, do it. It is, uh, it's wild. It's kind of con not controlled chaos, but these folks are real professionals. They are very good at what they do and they can drop and maneuver these trees with like surgical precision. It's, it's really, really neat. So with that value, uh, many factors are threatening that, are threatening Iowa's forests and, and their value. Um, but honestly, the greatest threat is not like an insect or a disease or a fungus or something like that. It's not this one singular thing. I would say it's basically the overall lack of active forest management. What I mean by that is most forests in Iowa are just simply not managed. They're let go, hands off. The landowners either don't go back there or just don't have, a, they don't value it enough to kind of call a forester and get a plan in place. And we know this um, from surveys, you know, the fact that about 80% of Iowa woodlands are privately owned and most of those owners do not engage in active management. And when you do that these day, this day and age, um, things can happen. It gets overrun by invasive species. They get degraded by um, non-sustainable grazing. They get removed, they get converted. Um, so when managed with the assistance of a professional forester, our woodlands are much more resilient to any and all emerging threats. But I will go through um, some of these threats here, especially invasive species uh, in the next few slides. But um, this list here you see on the left, you know, invasive species, huge fragmentation of our forests, you know, um, as these things are getting large parcels, getting busted up. Uh, you've got a mix of now management strategies going on there. Um, conversion. So conversion is the true loss of forests. Um, conversion to ag, you know, parking lot, housing. Um, hydrology alterations, going back to our um, floodplain and riparian forests. We've kind of messed up the flood cycle and how water flows through environment in the state of Iowa. So that's altered our, our bottomland forests. And of course, climate, what's gonna happen in the future. But if we manage our forests with professional foresters, that's gonna be our key to resiliency to all of these things. All right, real quick, I know, I'm pretty sure Tavone hit on some of these, but they're so important, I'm gonna say it again, <laughs> and we'll just go quickly through them. But exotic invasive species are really having an impact on our woodland. And think about structure, and species composition. As I go through these, think of how all of these can impact structure and species composition. And when I say species composition, think about regeneration potential. For example, here, this is a uh, Japanese knotweed. This is again up in Yellow River State Forest. Look at the shade this casts. Do you think any species is gonna regenerate under that canopy? So these, um, again, these invasive species have the potential to significantly alter species composition and structure. They're often aggressive colonizers. They lack natural control factors and they can thrive in a range of site conditions, especially disturbed sites or volatile sites. Uh, things where you've got a lot of earth and erosion moving like stream banks, like you know past construction sites, things like that. Grazed areas, overgrazed areas. So let's go through these. And again, just like before, think about how these things can impact structure and, and species composition. 
So garlic one, gar garlic mustard is probably the one that um, most folks say first when I ask what, what invasive species are on your mind. Uh, so this is a non-woody biennial, meaning that its life cycle spans two years, year one rosette and year two flower there. It's a prolific seed producer and along with dense growth can inhibit the establishment of native understory species. Exotic honeysuckle, there's about three of these out there. I just kind of lump them all together as, as non-native honeysuckle. There's actually a native honeysuckle in Iowa, but if you see a giant carpet of green in the spring or fall, it's most likely non-native honeysuckle. Um, big, big impact to Iowa's woodlands, especially central and south. Um, these woody species have berries that are spread by birds and unfortunately a very beautiful flower. Uh, they leaf out earlier and retain their leaves longer uh, in the growing season in comparison to native tree and shrub species. So uh, the best time to look for these things are early spring and late fall. Um, just like garlic mustard, they can choke out native understory species, they prevent regeneration of native tree species, and they, a lot of times what I've seen, they make it almost impossible to access your woodlands for management and recreation. And going back to water quality real quick, that super dense canopy uh, and reduced uh, understory can lead to bare soil, which can lead to overland flow, uh, an increase in overland flow and increases in um, surface runoff erosion. So buckthorn operates much like non-native honeysuckle. However, it can be differentiated by its bark, uh, which is dark and peeling. It has a dark fruit versus red, and it has an intense orange inner bark. So if you got a, 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 an idea that it might be buckthorn and the last factor you need is that inner bark, slice it open and it's bright kind of pumpkin uh, orange in it. One cool kind of fact, not cool, but interesting, I guess. It's the overwintering host for the soybean aphid, which is an, an agricultural pest. So tree of heaven looks much like our native black walnut. However, it has a much larger leaf with more leaflets and it's got an enormous shield skate shaped leaf scar. So the leaf scar is the place where the base of the leaf or the petiole attaches or was once attached to the twig. And it's got a much different seed. Obviously the very well known black walnut, but these are wind dispersed seeds. So they're a, a look like a samer with a seed and a, a wing on them. Like many invasive species, tree of heaven can be difficult to control and it might even spread further if control treatments are performed improperly. Same with like black locusts. So with this, these kind of really serious invasives, I really encourage you to seek advice from a professional forester before attempting to control uh, any invasive species. I don't know if Tavone mentioned this, but this is way high on his list as one of the big scaries in our Iowa woodlands. And if you've ever seen an infestation of Oriental bittersweet, you know what I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, so this is a non-native vine whose prevalence may shade out native species, girdle native seedlings, and add significant weight to tree canopies, uh, making them very prone to ice and wind damage. Um, there's a native bittersweet too, but in my experience, when you see native bittersweet, there's some ways to tell them apart and I can send that to you in our, our invasive species uh, content in the, the resource sheet. But if I ever see it, like one or two bittersweet vines, it's probably native. If I see a massive infestation like I, I do often, it's probably non-native. So just to plug here, um, we do have a great deal of invasive species content and resources on the web. Um, we've got a, a, a resource on chemical control of unwanted vegetation. You can get really lost in the weeds with herbicides and they get uh, they change all the time. But this uh, resource lets you know like the timing, the physiology, or, or the physiology of each plant, and then that would lead to the timing and the kind of herbicide you would want to use to control. And I'll say this um, with emphasis, is that it's usually never a one and done. It takes multiple techniques often, and it takes many times to really get invasive species under control. And then you've got to follow that up with diligent monitoring of your property following that, because they will come back if your neighbors are not sharing your, um, your management practices. 
So, but control is possible with the right resources, such as the ones we've got. And there's many out there, but we've got these on our on our website, including some cool ID um, resources. Another thing I'll mention is we have a clickable list of uh, contractors. You can see one here around the state. So if you click your county, you can find folks that will do this work for you for a fee. And then visiting with your forester, um, there's cost share out there. You know, you get dollars per acre that you can use to pay people like this person here to do um, a wide range of forestry uh, work that's been prescribed by your professional forester. Well, I'll just end on this. I mean, that was a whirlwind tour of Iowa forests, but um, to learn more, check out our, our Natural Resource Stewardship website. Um, consider enrolling things like the Master Woodland Steward Program. That's a six week field intensive crash course in forestry. We've got two going on next year. One in Lynn, Lynn and Johnson County and one in the central part of the state around Ames. Um, lastly, attend one of the many forestry field events that are hosted across the state each year. Attending webinars, attending Trees Forever events, you know, all the great things that they do. These events are, uh, these events are exceptional opportunities not only to learn, but also to network with forestry and other natural resource professionals, university folks, and other Iowans that share your passion for woodland uh, stewardship. So check that web website out regularly for notices of upcoming events. And I really do encourage you to get out and experience uh, Iowa's fascinating and invaluable forest resource. So with that, I, I really appreciate y'all joining us over the noon hour here and uh, thank you for watching. Wow, Billy, that was amazing. Can you leave your screen up there and keep sharing it while we go through yes. some uh, Q&A yep. here? Okay. So let's jump into it. We've got some questions right away. So why is downed timber important for pollinators? Awesome question. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll include that resource too, but think about the habitat and little nooks and crannies that they can get into for shelter, overwintering potential, things like that. So it's more of a habitat, a habitat benefit than like, Obviously, they don't flower or anything, but um, that, that habitat, that overwintering protection is huge. And I'll go one step further. Uh, check out the Pollinator Palooza webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago, and that really gets into the nitty gritty. Uh, basically, it's disturbed area, and that's one of the things that we focus on because we have a variety of pollinators that are either cavity nesters or ground nesters. And so ground nesters need undisturbed areas, and that's great places for them to have their um, to have their their homes essentially is under those snags and those brush piles and stuff like that. So check out that video for more information specific to that. Next up, we have um, ah, what steps could we take to protect volunteer oak seedlings? Ah, very good question. Um, okay, I'll give you some some kind of blanket pointers, but it really depends on where you're at and the scale of how many seedlings you've planted. Um, so you're going to protect them against a number of things. I would say the deer and, and rabbit, so herbivory. Uh, you're going to protect them against um, low moisture like we've seen up until this morning <laughs> in, in central parts of the state. So I'll, I'll do two situations here. If you're doing a smaller tree planting, I would really recommend um, for protecting against deer and rabbit and other, other critters, either using a, a, a wire cage or a tree tube. A tree tube is a plastic basically sleeve that you slide over the tree. It's about four inches in diameter and usually about five or six feet tall. Um, there's pros and cons to cages versus tubes, but that'll protect from um, them gnawing on it and it'll protect from bucks rubbing on it in the fall. And um, that's kind of that physical protection. And I would go pretty solid and I would go pretty tall. I wouldn't do like, you know, a couple you know, two, three foot, you know, chicken wire cage on there. I would really protect the heck out of them. Um, so some pros and cons of cages versus tubes, and I can send you this as well. It's like cages are great because um, they allow the tree to become a little bit more wind firm. So the tree can blow around in the wind and it gets that kind of wind firm nature to it. Um, they're very durable and they'll stand up to, to deer and other things kind of banging on them. One thing I don't like about cages is uh, wire is very expensive 
And if you're doing this, uh, the trees are going to grow up. The understory is going to grow up. Next thing you're out there, you're out there uh, thinning with a chainsaw. You're going to hit one of those cages with your chainsaw or your, your UTV. You're going to run over one of the posts or something. So anytime you have wire hanging around in the woods for a long time is, is kind of not a good thing. But I'll say in my smaller yard with a smaller scale tree planting, I caged the heck out of my trees because I knew that it wasn't going to get super overgrown. And I do have deer and rabbits in my yard. Um, I also put some tree tubes out just as an experiment to control, to, to see what the difference on growth was. So tree tubes are again, a, a plastic sleeve, a tube that you place over the young seedling and they, pro they provide almost a greenhouse-like microclimate in there. So if I looked at my uh, pecans, for example, caged right next to a tubed one, the tubed one is three times as tall this year, but it's not nearly as wind firm as the one in the um, in the in the cage. So at some point, when that tree expands out to a point where I think it could stand up to a buck rub, and the the tree is higher above any kind of browse that could happen, I'll remove that that tree tube. Um, another thing to remember: if the tree tube is not perforated, that tree can think it's like in an endless summer and not harden off for winter. So if the, tree, if the tube is not perforated, I tend to raise that tube up a little bit in late summer just to get that ceiling to know that um, winter is on its way and I need to start hardening off to get ready for, for winter. So um, at the end of the day, a tube versus a cage, um, you're not really going to impact the, the final mature height of the tree. It's just kind of a different tool for different situations that you've you've got. Another thing I'll say about me and the tubes is I live next to crop fields, so they're great for herbicide drift protection where the cages are not. So that's another kind of bonus for me for the, the tree tubes. Um, I'll say another thing about protecting seedlings is mulch. This is, again, on a smaller scale. Mulch really saved me in these last two droughty years when I didn't have an irrigation plan put together. So mulch, a layer of mulch backed a little bit away from the, the main stem of the tree um, really retains that moisture and helps keep the weeds down. Um, so that really saved me. Um, cool season grass are, grasses are very competitive with young tree seedlings. Um, so that's the one thing you really have to watch is, main, is getting those cool season grasses knocked down. That's a huge thing for protection. So protect against weeds, protect against herbivory, and protect against um, herbicide drift, for me anyway, is, is a big one. Now, if you're doing massive acres plantings, um, doing a tube is maybe not practical monetarily. Doing cages, maybe not practical monetarily. So you might want to think about just going in high numbers and, you know, with the thought that the deer can't get all of them. I've seen this a lot. And a way to do that is uh, you can plant tree seed instead of seedlings. So plant thousands of seed per acre and then go back and thin them out, you know, eight, 10 years later. So you've got so many um, stems out there. They, they literally just can't get all of them. So, um, but yeah, tons of ways I could go on about protecting young seedlings. Think about water, think about a brewery, think about um, herbicide drift, and I'll send some resources on that too, but I mean, it's really a question of scale. Um, what size, how many stems, how much money are you willing to, um, to drop on that? Perfect, perfect. Hey, your background with forestry and hydrology uh, is gonna be perfect for this question, I think, maybe. Um, this I'll try is my best. Line. So <laughs> our, our beaver, are beaver beneficial to riparian lowland forests? And how do they affect the hydrology? And then actually a follow-up to that is, how can we attract beaver to our stream? Okay, excellent question. I will, okay, actually I have a grad student working on this now. So I'll- No way. We do, yes, I know. Um, I will send a two, two links to two webinars that uh, we've recently done. Well, actually a virtual field day and a webinar. So, um, I'll say this right off the bat. I know that beavers, um, when placed in the right areas of the landscape, because I know they cause conflict, because we do a lot of things in our riparian zones, right? There's farming, there's tile drainage, there's bridges. So I'm gonna say they don't belong everywhere. There's gonna be a lot of conflict if they're everywhere. But 
in the right areas, they can do, and we're looking into this, but I hypothesize that they're going to do great things for water quality. When I mean that, I mean nitrogen, phosphorus, and what I'll call flood plain connectivity. So restoring um, the function of our streams getting out and accessing our floodplains. And when that happens, it retains flood water, it allows nitrogen to be removed, it, lo it allows phosphorus to be deposited. Um, I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. Let me go back here. What do beaver dams do? So they block and slow water, correct? Sure. Uh, and they're, they're really not like a filter. The water really doesn't pass through them. They're more like a solid living thing, like a dam. So they back up water, they slow the velocity of that water, and they store a lot of water behind these. So they've got a big um, flood mitigation impact, right? So the more flood water we can store back behind these structures, the less it's going to go downstream to like, you know, Cedar Rapids or Iowa City or something like that. What happens when you back that water up is all the sediment and what we call bed load or rocks and pebbles that kind of bounce along the bottom, they get backed up behind those structures too, which raises the bed of our streams. And I don't know if you've been to a stream in Iowa lately, they're very what we call in size. So they're 10, 20 foot stream banks, right? So that's not really normal. And what that means is the channel doesn't flood out into the adjacent floodplain anymore, which takes away an incredible amount of ecosystem goods and services that were once there. So these dams help restore that kind of bed grade to the point where we get more and more localized flooding, which might not sound good to people, but if we spread that flooding out in the headwaters and have it absorbed in like the sponge of the floodplain, it's a lot less water that's going down into our big cities and causing that major downstream flooding. Another thing when you slow that flood that water down in the stream and you collect a lot of organic matter and sediment behind the dam, that creates perfect conditions for what we'll call denitrification or removing nitrate from the water. Uh, long story short, if you get an anoxic situation, so you get that slow moving water, a lot of sediment, there's going to be low oxygen in that sediment. That the bacteria in that sediment are going to remove the nitrate in that water, convert it to nitrogen gas, and then that's a, a water quality benefit right there. We can also trap and store uh, phosphorus that's attached to soil particles either behind the dam or when the dam-induced flooding gets out and spreads onto the landscape and deposits its, its, um, its sediment load there with the phosphorus attached there. So one last thing I'll say is that when we do raise that stream stage up, we raise that water table up, the riparian uh, zones really benefit. So if you can think of that really steep stream bank in a typical Iowa stream, if we raise that water level up, that stream bank is gonna be saturated and it's gonna really benefit plants um, <clears throat> and others, uh, the vegetation. We've seen that when we go out around the perimeter of these beaver dams, there's so much more diverse vegetation around the perimeter than there once was before that, that dam was there, just because they've raised that uh, water table up. And again, that's, you know, groundwater it has a lot of great effects of uh, interacting with that, the soil there and nutrient removal as well. Um, last thing I'll say, I'm probably all over the place here, but is the wildlife impact. It's incredible the wildlife you see utilizing these dam pools and the, the dam chains that we, we see out there. Um, I mean, it's, it's wild. In some of these systems, it's just like an oasis of, of habitat, um, especially in these droughty years. It was almost sometimes the only water present in these streams was behind the beaver dam. So long story short, um, they're going to cause, they're going to be contentious in some areas, but if we do promote them in some areas, I do think they're going to do a lot of good. That's my hypothesis. We'll get the numbers here soon. As far as attracting them, um, honestly, this is kind of a, a tricky situation because I'll give you an example here. Um, someone planted a buffer using the, a forest buffer along their stream using the conservation reserve program. Great, awesome. Beavers then showed up <laughs> and started impacting the number of stems in that buffer where it was getting threatened to be knocked out of the conservation reserve program. So our thought with this study is, can we design like a beaver buffer that has enough food to sustain them, but, um, somehow protect the the main species of the buffer if that makes any sense so 
let them be, but also have the buffer thrive too. What are some species that they might be attracted to? I mean, what were they going after in that riparian species that was being impacted? Or um, what are some other, underst well, any uh, trees or shrubs that might be appropriate? Yeah, Shrub, that, beaver, great buffer. question. Um, so honestly, like I think they're like ice cream species. The stuff they love are things like willow and cottonwood. So willow and cottonwood, they will absolutely hammer, but those are rapid, you know, re-sprouters. Um, if they do, if they do uh, top kill them, but we've seen them hit everything from hackberry, oak, um, even cedar in some cases, mulberry, and their pattern of feeding has been really interesting. And my grad students got some uh, quick numbers on this, but that we're trying to kind of find out. It's not like they, like a human would go and you know, step by step and exhaust the trees until they're done. They're kind of random all over the place, uh, going after certain species and ones that are further from the bank and closer. Uh, but definitely Salix, Populus, uh, Willows and Cottonwoods, they're gonna hit really, really hard, but they do love oaks, uh, which is a, a, an issue for some folks. But yeah, the only thing we have never seen them really hit is things like Osage Orange, uh, Sycamore for some reason. And I think that has to do with the, the wood physiology. Um, but other than that, we've seen them hit a lot. And it doesn't take a lot, you know, in these drainage ditches that have, you know, bonsai mulberries and, and hackberries, they'll make dams out of that along with corn stalks. So they're, they'll hit most anything. So I think the, 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 maybe the trick is to get enough of the stuff they really like and then back off a ways and put the stuff that's there that you want uh, to kind of satisfy the buffer, but satisfy the beavers as well. So, got it, got it. Okay, we have a couple that are probably going to be really uh, long here, so I'm going to see if we can plow through a couple of relatively quick ones. Is there a way to tell? Uh, they have a lot of poplars. Is there a way to tell poplar from the native cottonwoods? Oh, um. To me, the poplar that are like hybrid have a, a, a less deeply furrowed bark, I would say. Um, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, I know it, if I looked at them, I could tell. But um, so cottonwood oh. to me have a, a very deep furrowed bark when mature. The poplars kind of do not. Um, and I'd probably say maybe even, the, I'm assuming the hybrid prop poplars grow very fast. The yeah. cottonwoods grow fast, but the hybrid poplars grow very fast and they die off very quickly. So if you see some kind of mid-range sized trees that are dying off, they are probably hybrid poplars. So um, we do have a, a tree ID key on our website if you want to start punching in those and kind of seeing the differences. But I'd have to, th I'd have to think about that. Uh, sorry, Connie, Connie, stay tuned. We'll get you more information. Um, Interesting story, side note here, but the first time I ever saw an American chestnut in Iowa, I was like, wait a second, that looks like a cottonwood because it had this deeply furrowed bark. And that's what I was looking at before I got up close and was able to see the uh, the leaves, certainly, and then the uh, the bur, uh, the oak, the uh, burrs. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. Okay, cost share. Do you have any insight into some potential cost share for growers um, in their wood lots or their properties yeah and that's one thing we really like to push because most folks are not aware of the all the resources you know financial technical service educational so I'll, honestly the first stop for cost share because it changes a lot and it's really hard for for me to keep track of it is your county usda service center and or your professional forester your iowa dnr district forester there which you can find a clickable map on our our website some of the common um, programs that are used are EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. If you've got land in row crop currently, the Conservation Reserve Program or CRP is often used. One really cool one that's flexible and I think more user-friendly for landowners is the REAP program, Resource Enhancement and Protection. Um, and that differs by county. So I would go check out um, your, your county service center and just ask. But 
the practices that are cost shared are anything from like brush removal, invasive species control, uh, replanting, which may include tubes and protection in there, um, irrigation for like windbreaks, things like that, mulching and irrigation for windbreaks. Um, there's also, speaking of windbreaks, there's a, an outfit out there, uh, the Coalition to Support Iowa's Farmers. They can provide cost share for, for windbreaks too. So I'll give a story here. There's also like little efforts and initiatives that are going on that you may not know about like my neighbor 20 years ago there was a pheasants forever initiative planted his windbreak mulched it for free so that was a pheasants forever initiative he got that at zero cost um, from that initiative that unless he went into the service center and asked he wouldn't have he wouldn't have known about that so um, anything you can imagine forestry wise <laughs> except for like timber harvest um, could potentially be cost shared in the state of Iowa. And if you're really curious, look up NRCS Cost Share Forestry Iowa, and there's a huge practice list. So anything from windbreaks to restoring uh, a bottlement area in 50 acres of, of hardwood timber, uh, weed control, it's, it's all under there. So there's a lot of funding available. So I definitely would check out your USDA Service Center and or your district forester or professional forestry consultant. Spot on, spot on. Okay. Um, want to certainly shout out here the Iowa Arborist Association, and hopefully we'll have them on real soon too for a webinar. Uh, we've got to get them in the mix here because they do great work all over the place, and uh, they can tell you how you could be a professional arborist. Boy, do we need more of them. Holy moly. Um, so Wayne County, lots of autumn olive. Multiflora rose, honey locust, all along the edges. Um, cutting them down just means they grow back. Any suggestions for a chemical to kill them? I'm assuming. I'm assuming. I'm assuming with that, cutting and treating, or maybe you yes. should mention that. Yeah. So we'll send that that um, resource out. So one common one that's used is triclopyr, and I, the brand names change all the time. And I would really say. I hate, I'm not copping out here, but really consult with your forester about what chemicals to use. Uh, and then always follow the label on that, that chemical. Um, but triclopyr is a common one, like glyphosate can be used if it's in a 50-50 mix. And this is all in that, that, that resource we'll send you. But um, there's a number of ways to treat them, depending on the size and the resources you have available. You can spray the bark, which is called basal bark treatment. And you mix a chemical in there that helps the chemical penetrate through the bark and get into the, the vascular system so it can go and do its thing. You can cut the stump and treat that ring of the cambium with chemical. Or you could uh, treat foliar. So, but that's very impractical with large trees and extensive acres of, um, of infestation. So um, I'll send you all that chemical list, but really. Consult with your forester and think about you, what resources you have available to you, both time and financially, um, to, to tackle these things. And I would say too, like with with addressing those, as I would tackle the least worst places first, <laughs> and kind of prioritize. If there's a spot that you can clean up pretty quickly, you know, as you move away from the edge and get into the interior of the forest, the invasive species tend to go down. You could fight that battle all day on the edge and maybe not win because of all the sunlight there. But maybe just work to focus on your interior, your forest, your woodland, and make that area uh, the best it can be because it's gonna be the biggest bang for your, for your buck. And then think about timing of the season too, and your forester can guide you on this, is think about the physiology of the plant. Um, when is it pulling resources up from the ground? When is it drawing resources back down to the roots? So a lot of times we apply that chemical late summer into early winter when that tree is pulling all of its resources down and you're going to get that chemical down into the root system and, and knock it out so hey real quick shout out to andrea okay here's your joke of the day everyone in a forest how can you tell if a person is a morel hunter <laughs> well the answer of course is when everyone else is looking up the morel hunter is looking down <laughs> spot on spot on okay Question here, when deciding to have a clear cut, how many oak seedlings should you have to ensure that oak is a component when mature? 
Like, Very good the question. There's, there's no limit, but it's really, um, again, this is going to go back to your site, your goals, your, your professional forester, but you're thinking, you know, it's thousands of seedlings per acre. And you really got to make sure that once you open that canopy, are they going to be competitive? So if you've got a thousand oak seedlings out there, but you've got a mid story of dense maple and hackberry, they're not going to be very competitive once that canopy is open. So there's steps before a clear cut to, to take, and it's called an even age management system, which we talk about a lot at our, our field day. So it's not like we just go out there and take the canopy off. What we do is we slowly over probably a, a period of like maybe 20 years. And again, this is different thinking. Forestry takes a little bit different thinking than like we're used to, but we'd go in and we'd maybe remove that shade tolerant mid story first, right? And we get a couple good seed years. We get a good crop of oaks established that are getting a lot of light and established. Then we go in and perhaps do what we call a shelter wood cut, which is we harvest some of the canopy just to get a little bit more light to those oak seedlings so they can get to a competitive stage. Then when we're ready, um, when we know that we take that canopy off, those oaks are gonna take off and there's not gonna be a lot of competition. We go in and we do the final clear cut harvest. So it's a it's a it's a series of events. It's not like we're just going out there and and taking the the top off. We saw that in the derecho um, when the canopies came down. What really came up after that was a lot of times, unfortunately, invasive species and uh, shade tolerant species. Not that they're bad or anything, but people that wasn't part of people's management plan. Um, so we see now the derecho almost sped up succession <laughs> in a number of cases. So it's a process and there's no real like hard number I can give you, you do this and you're this and this and you're this, but it's, a, it's about a 20, 25 year process of making sure you've got that oak regeneration ready before you take that, that canopy off for your, for your harvest. Another way to harvest is just called selection harvest. So a lot of times if I own 10 acres of land, I'm not gonna clear cut five acres <laughs> to get oak regeneration, that's, that's half my woodland. So what I'll do is, you know, you're probably going to lose a lot of the oak component on the landscape, but you'll have, you know, that later successional canopy. It's just going to be maybe meet your management goals and be nice as well. But you'll go in and my neighbor just did this. He'll selectively cut out individual trees for a harvest, creating canopy gaps for sunlight. And you're going to get a mixed age of species in there and a diverse range of species from that just canopy selection. So Again, it depends on what you want in the future on your landscape. There's a lot of different techniques and, that are out there to, to, to get it done. Spot on. Okay, I think we're coming to the end. Uh, let me see here. If you have any questions, be sure to get them in now or forever hold your peace here. Cost share, um, hybrid poplars. We have, um, oh, did that miss that one there? No. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I, I, I should have mentioned this. One quick way to know how many oak seedlings you have per acre is you take a yardstick and stick it you know, at your belly height and twirl around. That's about the radius of a one one thousandth acre plot. So every Say oak that seedling. Again. Well, we're just going to back that one up because that's fascinating. If I go out into a, 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 a prairie or wherever and I take a yardstick. Mm hmm. And I put it at my belly button and I do a little ballerina all the way around 360 radius. That represents what now? One one thousandth of an acre. So the, the deal is, and this is rough. This is a rough, this is not like a scientific study. This is like getting to know your woodland. You do that, you spin around every seedling that is in that radius, you times that by a thousand. So if I hit three oak seedlings, that's 3,000 seedlings per acre. If I hit 10, that's 10,000 seedlings per acre. And do that across and you know, spread it out on your land. Make sure to hit different you know, to topographic locations, different, don't just do it at one spot. Get a good representation of your property. That's a real quick way to see the regeneration that you've got out there. If you don't have adequate oak regeneration or any kind of regeneration, that's when you could come in and artificially plant seedlings uh, to get that, that, um, those numbers up. But typically, you're going to want thousands of seedlings per acre. 
if you think about an acre, it's not that hard to get a thousand seedlings per acre, but you're looking at, you know, three, four, five, six, seven thousand um, before you want to make that next step. So. Got it. Hey, another great question rolled in here. Okay. If we think about the impact of emerald ash borer and the fact that, you know, we have more ash than just about any other tree out there, even, even in our, you know, not even in the urban setting, but so in an unmanaged situation here where we're not replanting, what would maybe replace that species out on the landscape? Well, I mean, honestly, it depends on what's there, really. So I got my neighbor, um, huge ash component to their forest, but um, huge invasive species presence <laughs> as well. Unfortunately, so, those, yeah. so as those ash die, um, they're going to have an issue there with with invasive species prevalence. So, but if you think about species that share ashes kind of you know topographic niche and growth habit, um, you know things like um, hackberry, bitternut hickory, um, some of the bottomland species, um, they can probably step up their role there. But honestly, in in today's forests that are mostly unmanaged, when these ash gaps die off we're going to see a lot more hackberry we're going to see more a lot more elm to some point until they get knocked out with dutch elm disease um those two are going to be huge we'll probably see a lot more maple out there um, some of those shade tolerant species that have kind of built up in the understory um i think they're really gonna um increase in, in prevalence there so that's hard to say and honestly um if you've got a significant ash component, I think it's a good time to go out and assess what's the next generation of your woodland and see if that's what you want coming up or not. Uh, if it's not, you know, you need to make a plan uh, with a forester to address that because that canopy is gonna be opening up greatly. Yeah, let's get that captured here. Um, it's also a great time to take stock of what you have in the pipeline, so to speak. Okay. Great, great, great. I would say if you're looking to replace, that's why I hate saying like plant this or that. And like I said before, like just a diverse assemblage of species is going to make your woodlands so much more resilient. So look at your soils, look at your management goals and get a diverse range of, of native species out there that are appropriate. Oh, shoot. Well, I, uh, Put that what the answer went in the wrong box there. Sorry, folks. So I put that in the clear cut one and it should have gone in the uh, ash one, but regardless. Okay. What is a good way to control blackberry in a forest? Um, I don't know because we often don't control blackberry. Uh, we don't see it as a, a very competitive force against uh, regeneration like we do with like multi flora rose or buckthorn or honeysuckle. So honestly, a lot of times when we do these clear cut harvests and we create a an early successional forest, there's a lot of blackberry there. But uh, the, the canopy density is just not there and the oaks will eventually punch through and, and take off. So I'd, I'd have to look into controlling blackberry. Um, I just, we've never seen it as like a, this is really impeding our, our management. And it's certainly a, be able to cut know, it back, a, I imagine. And if you wanted to go organic, just keep cutting it back. Or is it does it run so bad that that's not even manageable? Yeah, if, if things like that, like eat like Greenbrier, which is native, like if it's impacting your management, if it's so bad it's impacting your management, then maybe take some steps. But if it's not, I mean, wait I, for I succession. Kind of recommend, <laughs> recommend leaving it there. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Hey, we're coming to the end and I want to thank you, Billy, because this has been fascinating and I can tell this is going to be a, a really good video for folks to watch because you laid out so nicely that big picture of Iowa forestry and all those different components. And then this Q&A session has been fantastic as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Yes, this is going to be recorded. It is recorded and we will post it on our YouTube page uh, for everyone. Reminder, uh, two weeks, we'll be talking about bugs and we hope to see you there. So have a great day, everyone. Take care now. Thanks.